you could pull the log of my trading background, it would be a total mess. I've had a long history of mistakes. Really for me, it was about taking emotion out of it. You know you're gonna be eventually right more times than you're gonna be wrong. Even if it's $5, if you have $5 a week to put away, that's something. The math is gonna work in my probability because the market can move up. It can even move down. I can be incorrect you know, several different ways and still keep that premium. There's countless ways to slice a portfolio out there, right? But we think we have something pretty special and see those who have succeeded. There's got to be a path there eventually. Investors, welcome back to another go round of Masters of the Market. Now, this week, I'm incredibly honored and excited to have Rob Pascarella on with me. He is the man, the myth, the legend, the brains over at Peerless ETFs. So, Rob, welcome to Masters of the Market. I want to first just toss a question right over to you because you got an interesting story and ask you about your story and how you got to where you are today over at Peerless. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, uh, Eric and I will duke that out whether I'm the, the <laughs> brains or not. I uh, hope he agrees with that. But I appreciate your time. And uh, we really love that you gave us uh, the opportunity to come talk about what we're doing. So Eric and I met you know, several years ago, and he decided to, to bring me on to help formulate what an option strategy would look like under his firm. He had broken away from a long time career in, you know, kind of wealth management in corporate America and decided to go it alone and, and build his own firm. We, we met through a mutual friend and we're speaking the same language. And I was lucky enough that he decided to to let me develop that and show him what I could bring to the table. And it's been a real honor to work with him and bring out a public product finally. Started, man, as a kid, I loved finance. Uh, I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer, actually, by trade. But, uh, and it's kind of funny that I didn't pursue the finance path because it's, I was always reading things what you know kind of funny now but watching stuff like cnbc all the time as a kid you know and really fascinated by the markets did the whole you know grow up mow lawns kind of do that business you know kind of grow little small businesses worked at a local power plant and decided that uh, I might have a little mechanical knack. Did some turbine installations and stuff of that nature that kept me busy in the engineering world, but all the while really kept that knack in the back of my head of, you know, what's available in the financial markets? How can I learn how to invest? How can I learn how to trade? If you could pull the log of of my trading background, it would be a total mess. <laughs> uh, I've made all the mistakes that you can make, I'm pretty sure. Several blow-ups of, you know, trying different things, intraday futures, buying speculative options, you know, getting that hot tip and going in on those penny stocks and doing long-term investing throughout, you know, throughout that process. But it's kind of funny, like, you try all these different things and maybe some people find opportunities or things that they're good at in the little inefficiencies and in some of those games, but man, I made all the mistakes I could make. And eventually I think you get to a point where you have a, a find something that's in your comfortability realm. And really for me, it was about taking emotion out of it because mm -hmm. you get into something and you know, Oh, it's up, it's down. It's you know, one of the, probably one of the worst things to happen to me that you're going to laugh at is the very first stock I bought. I read, you know, you read that hot tip online and I went all in, you know, I had $300 that I, you know, had ready to go and that stock tripled. So I thought I was a Heck genius, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yes, this is it. You know, this is the life for me. And then you kind of know the story from there where, you know, you're going to take chances and shots and those probabilities aren't going to play out long term. So I've had a long history of mistakes and eventually found options selling, which we can go into deeper in a bit. But long history of, again, making mistakes, really refining and finding something that worked for me and grinding that over time and taking that proficiency to the next level. So uh, meeting Eric 
I think came at the right time and we were able to come together, further refine that process as it, you know, by means of back testing and, and forward testing. So we forward tested by way of trading, um, you know, hedge fund under his RIA and decided to, to bring finally bring a public product out. Rob, I was happy to have Eric on not too long ago, and I'm happy to have you now on because Peerless offers an amazing ETF that's really there for the income-oriented investor. And so I'm, I'm excited to get into that ETF in a hot second. I do want to ask you, you know, when it, when it comes to your story, I mean, you didn't just trial and error, you know, make some money, lose some money and, you know, stay on the sidelines with investing. I mean, you went all in here. You're not just the everyday average Joe retail investor right now. Like, folks, Rob is working at Peerless ETFs at this point. So, yeah, I, I feel like you're almost underplaying the story there. I'm curious to know, after all the losses, what keeps you in the game and, and what kind of motivates you, even though you have this background of engineering and, and the love and passion for engineering, but yet here you are really taking on finance as well? What keeps you going? That's a great question. And I think, I think you know internally that you have it or not. Eventually, it's going to come to a point where maybe you understand that this isn't something that's for me to be active in, whether it's too much emotion or you feel like you have no control. And maybe just that passive world is for you. Sock away anything, you know, 50 bucks a week, whatever you can. That, I'll, uh, that aggressive nature that I just kept this desire to understand what I was looking at because you see those who have succeeded there's got to be a path there eventually, right? So I'm going to botch the quote, but something about, you know, it's the journey, not the destination. I think a lot of people enter this game like, hey, I'm going to be here. What can I buy? I can buy this. I can buy that. Um, and while that stuff's nice, I think really it's almost the mental challenge that gets gets me excited and keeps me excited about okay, if this happened, what can I do about it? Or how, how do I refine this process? I saw this go wrong. What happens? The yen carry trade blew up and I just lost all my money. Now what? I mean, that didn't happen, but it could. I'm sure it happened to somebody in August just now, right? Or uh, I didn't want Trump to win this morning and I was short or what, you know, there's probably countless stories. Whatever that process looks like, like for you to stay engaged or understand for yourself that the more passive game is for you. It was just something that, uh, again, the knack that I had that was the a desire to stay in the game, learn and understand and try and keep at it and, and make a career out of it. So something I've been harping on a lot rather recently, just from my observations on, on YouTube and seeing comments and speaking with uh, others in the financial field is, is the investor profile. And it's actually something that based on everything you're saying right now, it sounds like you have a really good understanding of like who you are as an investor. Yep. How yeah. would you recommend that all of us find ourselves as an investor to put this profile together? Is it in fact the trial and error way that you know, you kind of went down? Is there an easier, softer approach to finding ourselves as an investor? There's a couple ways to go about that, I would say. You know, for the general populace, if it's something you're not sure that you want to do, just talk to an advisor. You know, start there, say, hey, I want to start investing. This is this is what my current situation is. This is both the dollars that I have available and the bigger thing, the time that you have available and the passion of how deeply do you want to go down this path of finding a specific method that works for you? Or do you want to just do things passively and, and kind of let an advisor, you know, take the reins and go from there? So unfortunately, I think it is quite quite an iterative process of finding what works for you specifically, unless you know right out the gate that, you know, I, I don't want to be super involved. Here's what I have available. An advisor, please, you know, please show me a, a way to sustainable income or portfolio creation. So really diving like a... into... 
I was gonna say at Go least ahead. like an an entry point or something like right like because at the well, end of the day if, if some like the whole argument even with advisors if you don't want to use an advisor should should everyone go first to an advisor for the entry like let me just sit well, there, and talk to an advisor first you think you can certainly do that that's something that we recommend because we are advisors right we this is what we do we love to give advice and find out that person's situation is but in the real world today the other side of that coin is there are countless sources of information online. You can go to research what other people are doing, seeing what's available, you know, on that path. And you might eventually find yourself to an advisor anyways, or you might find out that you want to go it alone. So that's a great thing about spread the thing we're sitting on right now, right? I mean, YouTube's a great great source of tidbits of information and where even just where to get started. I was gonna say there's also great risk that comes with going at it alone because everybody yeah. I have on it, it seems like a lot of us have done the trial and error route. It's like, you know, there's wisdom in just asking somebody who works in <laughs> yeah. the field, right? A little bit yeah. of wisdom that's out there. But e yeah. that's even why I'm creating a lot of content around like discover yourself as yep. an investor, like understand your age, understand how long you can invest, understand your investor profile. I think that's the, arguably the greatest starting point for someone because we have young kids investing in things that you know retirees should be investing into and, and vice versa. But with that being said, Rob, what's the best approach for an investor to, to come into the market, to come into investing? Depends on your age, really. Like You, you kind of were spot on there. Depends on your certain situation. I guess that's kind of why we always lead into talk to an advisor first because Yes, there's tons of sources of information online, specifically where you are in your journey. If you're 20 or if you're 220, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's going to matter. It's going to matter what your certain situation is. Again, what capital you have available, what time you have available. Um, and I guess I would add to that, uh, what's the best way to get started is just get started. Don't be delaying. Don't be, you know, oh, I'll start next year. Even if it's $5, if you have $5 a week to put away, that's something. And it's going to keep you active. It's going to keep you interested in continuing to, you know, seek education or otherwise. So, Rob, you're on the advisor end of this, and I'm sure you encounter this a lot with Eric. Uh, but people who are coming in, sitting in front of you and saying, I don't, I don't even have $5, right? And it's like you could look at their, their budgeting or yeah. they probably don't have budgeting, but you can look at where they're spending their money and see these like Starbucks coffees, you know, like miscellaneous yeah. purchases, Snickers bars that check out. Like, what do you tell those people? Yeah. Is there a way we can overcome these excuses and, and really get a grip on reality? Yeah, I think Eric touched on this a bit as well. If there is literally nothing... And you, you have to address the problem first, right? You have to go after what the problem is, stop the bleeding, and start moving forward from there, right? So if it's credit card debt, you have to address that before you ever start investing. If it's unhappy in my job that pays nothing, you got to boost that income somehow, whether it's a side gig, whether it's a some type of online training to get to a career that you are interested in doing. You really have to address the issue first and work towards that goal of what can I put away for long-term growth and portfolio construction. So I know that, that you have a great point and that might not be the first goal, but there's always a first goal of, okay, if I can't start investing today, what are those reasons why I can't start addressing those, stop the bleeding, and then find a day zero where you can start moving forward? So we'll start moving forward. We'll get into some investing talk here. And I'm excited because it's such simple advice that I, we often don't even think about for whatever reason. But all the greats on Wall Street said it, the S&P 500 is going to be your gold. Yeah. What is yeah. it about the S&P that that's, makes it the gold? And should we go into the S&P 500? Should we stray away from it and go right into the options or into the ETFs? <laughs> should we go individual stocks? You should start in the S&P 500 and a market basket of, uh, you know, if I had dollars to put day zero, you want to have some S&P 500 exposure. What is it about it specifically? Even under the hood, there's some dynamics that we might disagree with, but it's actively managed under the hood, right? So if there are companies that are seriously underperforming, they're going to be pulled out and replaced with a company that is performing. Uh, I think the most, I think it was actually 
was I guess it was the Dow now that Intel was just pulled out of and Nvidia was put into right because Intel's just kind of seemingly maybe got this headwind against it and, and Nvidia's performed S&P is very similar where it's actively managed it's a, it's balanced rebalanced often and it's taking a diverse basket of you know the top 505 actually names gives you market exposure from day one at, while you again while you can take time to educate yourself or get other advice on how to spread your wealth otherwise s p 500 is always step one because it gives you instant super liquid access to the best financial markets in the world definitely a good place to start You're right i love it it's such simple advice that if Probably the vast majority of us just did the S and P, you know, from the, from the early ages, we'd be just fine. Uh, of totally. course, you can you can always build on top of that foundation yeah. and and try your odds at making more. So I want to talk about that because yeah. that's always more fun than just the S and P five hundred and what all of us here on this channel are typically doing. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you about portfolio construction in that sense. How w w kind of what's the deal and how to build an ideal portfolio? Do we have foundations with ETFs? Or again, can we shed off the ETFs and go build a you know portfolio worth of just individual stocks? It depends on your situation. If you're getting ready to retire, maybe you need some income. Maybe you want a little bit more stability because in the equity world, we don't know when the equity portfolio might slow down. The earnings might come down. We may have um, something that has some geopolitical issues or you never know what might tip off kind of a reverse in equities. So we diversify and there are certainly other things to do. But if, if you're super young and you want to get started, that's a great place to simply go 100% and get some equity exposure and start from there. It, again, if you're of age where you want maybe a little bit more stability, you need to diversify into some other income stream, you know, income producing products. Hate to hate to keep reiterating that it depends because it does depend on what your personal situation is. And and for those of us now looking for the income, and this is yep. where it really depends, I feel like I harp on this quite often on the channel. If you're a younger investor, you know, chances are some of these income producing ETFs are not your, your golden goose and it should be some more growth. Yeah. But then there's the other investor who's out there, right? Nearing retirement or elder in, in their years and they need that income. Peerless ETFs, of course, has a very powerful ETF. And I want to ask you about the Peerless ETF and its strengths. Share broadly what this ETF is all about, how it produces income and why Peerless over some of these other ETFs out there, the Yield Max ETFs, what everybody else loves. Yeah. When it comes to diversifying, um, like we said, again, why not just go into the S&P? Uh, there have been times, extended time, uh, time frames where the S&P doesn't perform, right? I mean, if you look at the 2000s, I mean, that was basically a, a lost decade of performance. It eventually paid off just to keep dollar cost averaging into the S&P. But again, you've got to have that time frame, right? You got to have that extended outlook on this is what I'm going to do. I eventually believe it's going to outperform and we ended up coming out of that period, right? We have a pretty good stat on our website that uh, a lot of actually firms have turned their heads towards this as well as when it comes to PE ratios, we seem to be a little overextended right now at where we are at in the market. What's that to say about you know, well, some people say, well, PE ratios don't matter anymore and we might grow into those earnings. And we might, but cyclicality says that we're maybe, you know, due for a little bit of a slowdown. And what does the next two, three, four years, what does the next decade look like? Where we're at with the S&P PE right now for next year, the short answer is we don't know, right? The data says next year could be another gangbuster year. We're just going to go at it. It could also be a not so good year. But if you look at the data shows where we're at in the PE right now, projecting over the next decade, that correlation is very strong showing that we're probably due for a little bit more of a slower period because it has been so gangbusters. So what can we do in that environment to help generate some returns? And again, 
if you have the time frame to do that, you can just sit and uh, continue to dollar cost average into equities or other areas of the market that you see fit. Or you could do things like sell option premium, which is what we're doing, that does not rely on market growth to produce that income. So our ATF um, specializes in this. We have an extremely mechanical approach to this that, again, I kind of alluded to it earlier, takes out emotion or kind of guessing of what's going to happen in the market tomorrow or the next month or the next year. We have a very mechanical option selling premium collection program that does this and it uh, performs well and sideways, even slightly down markets because of um, the cushion we're providing ourselves on these options. What differentiates ourselves? some of these other new ETFs you're seeing with, uh, we're certainly new. I don't mean to say that any new T ETF has disadvantages because we all do, but some just seem extremely aggressive in the fact that you need to understand explicitly what is happening within the functionality of that fund. Some of these levered, like two, three X levered, those aren't funds that you want to hold. If you're a trader, you can trade them to take advantage of that leverage, but um, everyone should definitely be reading and understanding what they're utilizing. And that to say it means no difference for us, right? We are totally transparent in this mechanical options selling program that we implement, very diversified. We use many uncorrelated assets within the program, meaning that if financials have a really bad week, maybe energy has a good week and hold, you know, continues the performance, or maybe, you know, gold has a great week and caps don't. You know, there's lots of uncorrelated assets in there to keep the performance relevant. So we have lots of, if you go to our website, there's great videos for explanation on what the option wheel actually is, how we are incorporating that process into these individual positions and how we create that income. Why sell options as opposed to buy them? Perfect. So we could have another two hour talk on options math, right? <laughs> Which I would love to do by the way, but, um, we got all day. When it comes to, yeah, we got all day. <laughs> no, I, what really is beneficial here is to think about how options move and how they're priced and an options buyer which is a speculator has to overcome what i consider you know many variables to be successful where we're putting the probabilities in on our side by selling that option and what i mean by that is to drill down the basics of options math options are priced with really two components there's an extrinsic value, which means how far away from the price of the stock that I want to be trading is this option. And the extrinsic value, meaning things like what's the volatility right now? How fast is this moving? How much time is there left in the options contract? And when you're buying an out of the money option, let's say, that I want to get leverage and speculate to say that, uh, let's say, t I think Tesla's gonna go over $300 this week, right? You've got to overcome the distance, which is that ex ex uh, intrinsic value. You've also got to overcome what I call the velocity. So it has to overcome not only the price, but it has to do that in your allotted time. And by the way, the value of that option is eroding just because of the passage of time. And that's that ext extrinsic value. So if you're gonna be an options buyer or a speculator, you got to be very good at all those and timing it. And that's pretty low probability for all that to happen a couple times in a row, let alone if you're gonna be consistently generating returns using market timing effects like that. So option seller, using the law of large numbers, right, large number of currencies, we're doing this over and over and over on a short time frame uh, with many products, putting that, lar putting that law of large numbers and high probability in our, in our hip pocket, right? So I'm not really 
guessing on when and how I'm going to be correct. I just know that the math is going to work in my probability because the market can move up, it can move sideways, it can even move down as low as the option that I'm selling. I can be incorrect, you know, several different ways and still keep that premium and that probability is in my favor. So I'd rather have the higher probability trade that gives me consistency and a lower income than the super leveraged, much higher payout trade that I got to be right on every single time. And I just know that's not going to going to happen. So option selling is really, again, play on law of large numbers and getting that consistent income stream because you know you're going to be eventually right more times than you're going to be wrong. And even when we're wrong, in our case, as we can talk to continue to talk about how the functionality of the fund works, even when we're wrong, we get to collect that asset at a lower price and then get more option income on the flip side of that. And it's just a really great consistent strategy. And by the way, I'll kind of, that reminds me to segue to uh, asking you, what other business venture have you participated in that pays you to put in a lower bid right say you were uh say you were into flipping houses and you want to buy a particular property at uh 300 grand the price is 325 have you ever had a realtor say well if you promise to buy at 300 which is a discount I'll pay you today. You know, you're basically putting in a bid. <laughs> and uh, you know, if nobody else is interested, down, all the way down to 300 you get to buy it cheaper at 300 and we'll pay you for that. That'd be a pretty interesting concept, and that's exactly what's going on here. We know that we say we want to buy financials at $50, but it's trading 53 I'd like to buy it at 50 I promise to buy at 50 I buy at 50 this week. Doesn't go there. I keep that premium that I was given to put that promise in. And if it doesn't happen, I keep it. If that $50 hits, I buy where I say I was going to buy. And we continue to the other side of the option wheel, which is selling covered calls to generate more income. It so sounds like a very safe safe approach for those who know what they're doing. And it, it sounds like, I mean, it really is a, a cushion and you're, it's probabilities we're talking about here. Now, because of the probabilities and the cushion effect, I'm curious to get your standpoint on this. Why not go all in on an ETF like this? That's a great question because we're an advisor and we have to look at every different situation and see what makes sense for your particular folio construction right so if you're younger and you need you need some long-term equity exposure to really get that growth again if you look at the s p it has grown substantially right this fund is basically if we get that kind of market you're gonna really only contain the put premium that you're bringing in and the collateralized uh, obligation that we have to offset those uh, options positions, which are T-bills. So you're going to get T-bill income, you're going to collect that put income, but you're really not going to get much else. And while that return is not only substantial, but pretty, um, pretty reasonable return, you're not going to get a total outperformance that a f uh, equity exposure might get you. So this goes back to a balanced portfolio, right? you're going to have a sleeve of income or safety because we're not really stock pickers, right? We're not going to say XYZ is going to go up tomorrow or next year. That's why you have a diversified allocation. You've got some equity exposure for a long-term upside growth. You have some income in case we do have that lost decade. You can be generating more, um, generating income for yourself if the market doesn't appreciate while you sit and wait in equities or other vehicles that give you that long-term growth. It comes back to um, being prepared for many different situations, being allocated prudently that uh, you have exposure in, in any market. So Rob, I have a fair amount of viewers who are out there that are actually in their elder 40s, 50s, nearing retirement, some in retirement, would this type of ETF be an ETF that they can, I'll say, double down on at least, if not, you know, all in? So Eric and I, but this, 
what a caveat to that is this is how we would trade if we were trading personally right so i am prop i am and i know eric is also over allocated because you want an alternative sleeve in your portfolio maybe you have some discretionary dollars that you get to have you know maybe still you're still trying some different trading strategies or things of that nature right all those dollars for us are allocated to this because it's how we would be trading anyways we believe in the strategy we have um, long-term viability in this strategy so that's why we're over allocated personally but when uh, an individual investor needs those separate buckets for the purposes that you know we've we've been hammering on and having that all that alternative sleeve uh, really protects in a sideways market and we think it's prudent to to allocate to that uh, definitely not definitely not an all-in type situation to what you're saying you want to have exposure in different areas and we think that this really is something that is special and gives great income opportunities through those flat market situations I have a lot of viewers out there who are also I mean thrilled when it comes to dividend investing and earning passive income is this something that the younger investor or just the, the everyday dividend investor can add to their portfolio? If you're a younger investor and that is really what you're desiring is dividend income, we think uh, we're a super viable option for that. You may do a bunch of research and find yourself really enjoying diving into fundamentals of companies that pay dividends or you may be someone who uh, is a math whiz and loves and loves bond math and wants to get into you know assembling all these different bond ladders for income there's countless ways to to slice a portfolio out there right we think we have something pretty special in terms of a dividend provider if that's what you're seeking if you're seeking current income we have um process that is reliable and again it kind of depends what your goals are if you're younger and want to take more risk maybe you take more risk in equities and a little less risk in the dividend world but um yeah there's again there's tons of ways to slice that up and you got to find maybe what what gets you excited what's the ideal number of holdings in a, a portfolio like some investors who have come on here have spoken of their portfolios typically the average joe investors who join me but some of them have like portfolios of 80 90 stocks and then you got the other end right maybe 10 15 stocks i'm curious to get yeah. your take there it depends on how much time you have and what you want to put into research, you know, 80, 90, if you got 80 and 90 positions, why just not own an index? You know, it sounds, especially if it's a diversified, I think you'd have a, a hard time with long-term outperformance of just like an S&P, right? To, to allude to what we talked to before. But again, if you want to, if you want to just diversify across a couple, a couple positions, I would say no more than 10, know them in and out. Uh, understand what makes them move understand thing you know if you're on the fundamental side be looking at the cash flow statements and stuff of that nature if you're a dividend person um, you really want to know those names inside and out so if you see something conspicuous or something changes you know when your personal situation changes that's hard to do when you're talking about 80 names right it better be a, a full-time position when you're getting that high but 10, 15 names, something that I always talked about to Eric is, I brought this to him when we first met really is, I never, even as an advisor today, if you if somebody wants to speculate on something, maybe two, three, four, five stocks that they're super interested in, absolutely do that because it keeps you engaged in the market. It keeps you keen on what's going on, when things might change, as long as you're doing other things that you know aren't speculative, elsewhere in your portfolio and you have headroom to do that i welcome that because i think that is a, a great way to stay super engaged curious to know if you have any stocks like that in your portfolio where you're super engaged with them but they're more speculative bets yeah totally i mean we again um it's i'm no different right it's the same we can we can sit here and and preach uh safety all day but you got to have some things that excite you and um not only engagement and names but i just in generalities i like learning and seeing what other people are doing even when i don't agree with it like uh you know some, 
as we alluded to earlier, some 2x, 3x ETFs. We kind of scratch our head, but it's kind of fun to even just delve into the details and understand why that firm brought out that product and see just see what's available and learn what other people are doing so there's different levels of engagement but um yeah i definitely you gotta have a you gotta have a a little bit to play with just to stay engaged so it's funny talking about some of those two or three x or or even the yield max etf sometimes i get those comments on the channel right and someone's like i you know i don't know threw twenty thousand in on this i'm making the hundred thousand dollars in dividends you know you why aren't you just talking about this etf and then I look at it like a month later, I'm like, I wonder whatever happened to that investor. You know, like, did, yeah. what, like what was their end result? Are they still yeah. successful? I want to ask you, though, about some green flags and red flags. I feel yeah. like every investor who jumps on here always gives really good insights on the flags. And so what I mean by that is you're out there, you're looking for new stock ideas. I'm curious to know kind of your filtration system and what green flags come up that says like, yep. Rob, you're all in on this one. This is a golden goose. What red flags come out that say, go the other way? So when it comes to trading the strategy, I'll say first that we're extremely mechanical and process driven. So when it comes to wheel and the private hedge fund we're running, emotionless, totally emotionless, trading the strategy as as we have come to develop it and understand it, right? So outside of that, I would say if an individual investor wants to, you know, tinker in a portfolio, some green flags, um, you know, positive, positive and growing earnings, limited debt or using debt correctly, then it looks like they understand the use of debt. Uh, listening to earnings calls, you want to be learning while I think some uh, technicals are invalid. Even, again, seeing what other people are doing in the technical realm keeps you engaged and maybe gives you a little bit of context in in a realm where there might be some limited information. Red flags, definitely anything accounting-wise that comes out. If there are accounting red flags, you probably want to stay away from that. Incorrect use of debt. (laughs) The uh, issuing of stock at an all-time high as always kind of tells me that management, you know, maybe needs some liquidity, maybe needs some exit liquidity. You don't really know. Definitely, that's why all that boils down to your question before of how many names. If you're looking at all these different things for 90 names to totally understand those names, that's totally inviable. You get down to, down to a couple names or a couple names that you maintain interest in or be cycling through a list to keep things relevant and exciting for you so So look i I have almost trouble keeping track of my 14 names yeah and you got people with 90 names 80 names like i my hats off to them if if you could successfully do that but in my in my opinion i agree with you it's like just go for an etf at this point you mentioned debt and and the proper usage of debt and the improper usage of debt and how that comes out, right, with filtration and a green flag and red flag. Can you share with us about, when it comes to the green flags and, and red flags and debt, the proper usage of debt and the improper usage of debt for companies? Because I think that could be a little bit confusing for us retailers out here. I guess when it comes to debt with an issuance of unre- something that seems unst- unsustainable, I would really shy away from that. And I would like to correlate that because we're not really in any individual names yet. We don't consider ourselves a a research shop that is diving into individual names too much. You definitely want to look out for issuance of shares at an all-time high and non-stop recurrence of debt that kind of seems irresponsible. But I would correlate that back to our product and the use of leverage. So... When you're selling options, there's a notional value that that's going to expand out to. And if you're using more of that, that would be considered leverage, which you certainly can do. And a lot of people that trade this strategy do incorporate, but you gotta really understand that you are borrowing, you are using debt. In this case, it would be the broker's debt to finance that coverage and you're responsible for that 
if that hits. So it's kind of kind of correlates over a little bit better to what we're doing. Talk about it that way, right? So if I'm borrowing irresponsibly to take on a position that I really don't have risk management over, in the individual name world, you would be looking for that as a red flag. In our world of the wheel strategy in which we're incorporating or not incorporating that actually, we don't use that leverage. We only use the notional value to which that position is going to expand to. We don't lever past that. So we're always within the confines of our allotment for such position and we don't take extraneous you know, debt outside of that that narrow window macros or technicals let's talk about both of them and how they come together for you in wheel they don't matter uh again we don't we don't consider ourselves market timers or stock pickers there are a number of we think we have valid use of uncorrelated assets such that we're going to be able to sit through any market period, right? Or keep collecting either put premium, call premium through any um, or most market situations. We, again, we're not considered a research house or, you know, really in depth on that. So I really kind of shy away from those answers. But because I mean, how many times are you going to be right? And how it comes back to the law, law of large numbers, right? You might be right on a timing, um, on timing some certain name or playing an earnings report, but I would rather have the prob high probabilities considering options math in my hip pocket than uh, an inkling or, you know, a whisper online about an earnings beat or something like that going in my favor. So I've had enough failures again through all that stuff that, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm perfectly content sending back and, and letting the math work in my favor. I was going to say you, you failed on behalf of all of us. <laughs> so <laughs> so we don't have to. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. So just to make sure, like we're using a wheel strategy and I really won't have to sweat macroeconomic. I mean, we just had a major day even, you know, this week. Yeah. Elections, interest rates coming down in the future, things are happening. With this strategy, you really are shrugging off macros is essentially what I'm gathering from this. Yeah, we are, because let me put it this way. Let me ask you a question. Say uh, on Monday, I gave you, you had tomorrow's newspaper today. You remember that TV show in the oh, 90s? Yeah. Say I gave you the election <laughs> results on Monday. My YouTube How, channel would be off the uh, chart. Yeah, uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no, and in all seriousness, I gave you the election results on Monday. I said, Tuesday night, here's the result. Would you know how to trade it and trade it successfully? Do you think you could trade it successfully? I feel confident in it, oh, but I okay. have to be honest with you. All right, well, I'm <laughs> Just because I feel I confident wouldn't. in it, it actually doesn't mean anything because the whole world's yeah, going to exactly. operate in a totally different fashion. <laughs> there, yeah, abs yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think there was actually a study on this. I'll have to look it up um, later. But given the positive or negative earnings returns, there was literally almost no edge. In, say, I, say I knew Apple's earnings were going to be gangbusters when they came out with earnings. Sometimes it goes up out of that. Sometimes it comes down out of that, right? It all depends on positioning and maybe some options market hedging or big positions coming out or, you know, you don't really know. So I can't confidently say, even if I would have known Trump was winning on Monday, would I know how to position a, to your answer, I can put a pretty educated guess to it, but I can't tell you with certainty. It's the same thing in what we're doing. I'm not a market timer. I'm not a strategist where I can time maybe gold's going to go up and finance is you know, going to come down, the finance, financial sector. We're just, again, using that law of large numbers, putting those trades on with a high number of occurrences uh, and letting that buffer work in our, in our favor. You know, it's interesting, right? Because even I answering the question, right? It's like, I want everything in me is like, yeah, you know how to play it, right? That's the confidence, yeah. right? But also yeah. what that is, is it's total ego, right? Yeah, I know how to play yeah. it. I'll play it. And the thing that I've become, I think, better at over the years is like hearing the ego and then 
taking the pause to be like, if you listen to the second half of my sentence, right? It's like, but in actuality, it's like, I'm not going to know the future. Yeah. Also, to your point of what you just shared, right? It's like, you're going to feel good that you have the information, but Apple can shoot up on, upon earnings and come right back down. And yep. you, had, you had the answer. You know, why didn't you play it right? Yeah, you had the answer. Why didn't you kill it? You know? Well, how, how do we... How do we shed ego in this game of investing? I mean, that's a philosophical question for us, you know, but I'm curious to know your answer there. My personal answer is I, I, f I feel like I learn lessons slower than others. Like I've got to do it again, personal opinion, right? Maybe externally it's not this way, but I feel like I'm the type of person that's got to do a lot of things wrong or incorrectly before <laughs> I am confident in myself or I've learned my lesson. Again, I've failed so many times learning what works for me. And you unfortunately got to take your licks and get over that. I mean, there's those who gonna have it instantly, right? There are those whiz, whiz kids who are just gonna, you know, be these phenoms that can stay calm and understand what they're looking at. And there are those of us who've, who've got to learn lessons and hang in there and just keep at keep at it and if it's again if it's something that is deep within you that you want to do long term and have a passion for doing the actual process and the learning and the failing is reason enough over the success that you short term success that you may or may not get the process is more interesting to me than that instant success knowing that long term it's going to work out and we're going to find you know you'll find something that works for you you said two things throughout this interview actually quite a few times one of them it was about process right you said that in the beginning and now you're saying it uh, again and you also talked about being emotionless as an investor and i read a book uh it's actually one of my favorite books of the year here in 2024 which was Richer, Wiser, Happier by Richard Hauser. And it was a fantastic book. It just it talks all about, you know, professionals on Wall Street. And I'm not talking about, you know, I want to say the, you know, the Franks and Hanks of Wall Street that are just sitting wherever they sit yeah. on Wall Street. I'm talking about like the sages of Wall Street, Buffett, Munger, right? Yep. These guys. And they talk all about essentially becoming emotionless, not listening to the noise and have it falling in love with the process. I want to ask you if, if people out here, cause a lot of us, if we're really being honest with ourselves, we're not in love with the process. We're in love with money. Yep. And if that's the case, I'll just flat out ask you, should we go just S and P into ETFs? Stop trying to pick winners. Like, cause we know again, statistically speaking that that, it does, it's not going to work, right? Like for the very few, it does. But if at the end of the day, like we, we have the ego, we're not really in love with the process. We're just trying to pick winners. Yep. Should we really be doing this? It's a great question. And what comes to mind for me is you and I and other advisors or traders or individual investors do this because we love it and in factuality of what you said if you're having a hard time with that it's not for you and that's okay it doesn't have to be for you that's why there are service i mean financial services is the largest industry in the united states now right so or one of them that's because it's not for everybody and it doesn't have to be for you and you can talk to an advisor you can go learn things online you can do different things but there's no sense in sitting and trying something that is going to make you miserable and continue to fail and continue to fail unless you really have that long-term insight that gut feeling that it's what you want to do long term i've got friends and mentors in multiple areas that you know that finances for some people and you know, I got a, a mentor that just builds businesses and um, really he has an insane knack for connecting people. That's what he's good at. He hears some, one person talking about water. He knows a guy who started a water, you know, so he knows this guy and he'll connect them. 
Uh, I've got a buddy who has absolutely crushed it in real estate. Maybe finance isn't for him, but he knows everything there is to know about his niche. So finding what works for you, finding that passion, finance and trading and investing isn't going to be for everybody, but that's why there are those of us out there that have pursued it so we can help others that don't share that interest. I mean, I'm just, I'm sitting here thinking about it and I'm like, how many of us viewers, you know, how many of us out here, how, are we really in love with it? Because yeah. Buffett, he never talks about the, you know, at the end of the day, his stacks of cash on the table. He talks about the process all the time, never about the money. And then you go yeah. on YouTube and you look at the comments, right? Like what are people saying? Oh, money, return, What's that's return? it. And What's it, the return? Yeah, yep. nuts. But on the yep. topic of, of icons and, you know, investment heroes, I'm curious to know, Rob, you, I mean, you've had, again, this fascinating history uh, and, and a long time, you know, doing a lot of reading and watching the news. Who have been some of your biggest icons that you've watched over the years? And more so, I'd love to know, which one would you like to invite out to a dinner or grab a beer with? What type of <laughs> questions would you ask him or her? Awesome. Yeah, awesome. No, I love this question because, uh, and I'm glad you asked it because it's really, honestly, it's equal to my passion for trading and investing is just learning from others and learning, seeing people's stories, just like you, you started with hearing people's stories, how they got where they got, um, learning about different strategies and this fantastic, the fantastic thing we have now with YouTube and, you know, all the content online, uh, the beer would really just be a formality, I guess, because there's so much material out there these days. But, uh, <laughs> and to, and to add to that, I mean, you, people that have passed on too, like, uh, one of my, someone that comes to mind, um, as I say that is like a Jim Simons, mm. I really kind of, uh, really leaned into his career because he was not finance first either, right? He he has a super interesting mathematical background, uh, really just loved numbers, had a very interesting career that involved code breaking and, you know, all this super interesting stuff to hear about. And he stumbled upon finance later in his life. So I kind of identify with that story. He's no longer with us, but there are so many podcasts and stories and books on on his story out there you can you can feel like uh you've really understood that person's story and can grow from that and actually i, I actually heard that originally it was another person i would love to have a beer with or a dinner with is naval ravikant and he two is new more names you're like, bringing to the to mass really the market. Yeah, Naval the boring is, ones are when people uh, say Warren Buffett. So we, we, we yeah, all know. <laughs> we all know Warren, and yeah. I'm you know that's that's great stuff. But um, if you don't know Naval, it, it's he's and it's more like um, he's almost more of a modern uh, like philosophy almost. But it's so he goes so broad on so many different things. He has, so I recommend to you and your viewers to go listen to um, one of his on Spotify, one of his talks is like how to make money or how to understand money. And it's a three to four hour just chat with uh, him and his associate where they've taken all these notes and give you all these thoughts. And he just goes really, really broad. And he is he's the pinnacle of what I would consider an investing life to be is to get to like an angel where you're just helping other small businesses. And I think that would kind of be really cool. Um, pinnacle of an investing career, but Naval would be a really interesting person to, to speak to. And then you got, um, portfolio, like on the portfolio construction side of that, um, do you know Anton Creel? I don't. I don't know Anton. Okay. So Anton Creel, and I would throw into that basket uh, the hedge eye guy, Keith McCullough. Keith. Guys that just, they have a lot of, um, 
a lot of knowledge and a lot of wisdom. Again, you can find it all online where especially Anton has a couple really good YouTubes for someone wanting to get into finance on what is what is money? What's the understanding of how it's used, why we have it, uh, different structures of how you should be thinking about it and putting that mental framework around why we do what we do. So that's really interesting to me. And I also would have to, I'm sorry I'm giving you so many. No, this is but, great. Uh, I, yeah. I said pick then, one person, you're giving me yeah. dinner for schmucks. I you're like, I got to, a whole, yeah. I'm bringing a whole Wall Street. I want to have dinner with everybody. <laughs> yeah. and, and the last one I'll throw out there, uh, again, the super nice guys that you have, all their stuff is free, but Tasty Trade and the options oh, around. The Tasty Trade guys um, are epic. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just just gold. I mean, you can go on there and find out anything you learn, anything you want. It's all free. You can email them and they respond. It's just I was going to do a really, bit with the really Tasty great. Trade crew. You should. You should. They're, it's it's they're in the fantastic. works. It's in the works. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Okay. Good. So I'll quit I'll quit rambling on about my uh mentors for or per, 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 there, that's it. perceived mentors, <laughs> but there's just so much good stuff out there to listen to. Or Rob, read. I got one last question for you, and this is my favorite question to ask every master of the market. I think you know what's coming up here. But I'm gonna toss over to you ten thousand dollars right now to just invest into an ETF or individual stock, anywhere you'd like to invest it. Love to know where it would be, what it would go towards, yeah. and why. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, it's the, a great question that I love hearing everybody's responses to, and I'm going to give you a little bit twist on it that you might not be expecting. So, obviously, all-time highs, everything is ripping today. Uh, we even had calls this morning coming in for clients, you know, hey, what do I buy? How do I take advantage to this, right? That's that's how it goes when something like this happens, which means to me that it's probably not the best time to go out and just jump all in and and go all out, right? So given the particular situation that we're in today, I I would approach a fresh $10,000 if I was coming into the market like this. If you're new. Uh I would start a habit and I've heard all kinds of different, you know, numbers on this, but you know the stat on how long it takes to create a habit. Like some sometimes sure, I hear sure. 31 days, sometimes I hear 90 days, whatever it is, I'm not really sure, but if you start a habit of I'm going to invest $50, $50, $50, start dollar, car, dollar cost averaging into S&P 500, whatever it is you want. Pick, pick an index, uh, maybe some different sectors or, uh, you know, balanced portfolio like we've described. Just start that habit today, tomorrow. You don't want to dive in with $10,000 when we're up, you know, I think the financial sector was up like 10% this morning or something like that's not a time to be diving all in. But what you can do is start chipping away at a process, right? Get this ingrained. I'm going to invest every week and you'll have that for say, let's say you do that with half of it for the next year. Take that other 5,000 and invest in yourself. Invest in whether it be find a highly rated course or a uh, mental processing or dive into a whole bunch of different books that are getting really good reviews or do research yourself on what path you would like to take education wise. Um, get good gear. This is something that I totally overlooked as a novice, especially trader, if you want to trade, man, I started, uh, so I'm historically like a Mac guy. I just, they seem to work better. They, you know, they don't typically overheat or get, you know, get the viruses or have problems that my windows machines typically have. But I started trading futures and one of the best platforms to trade futures on is Sierra chart, which is a windows only program. And I refused 
to buy a Windows <laughs> machine. <laughs> and like, so I tried like, there's all these programs where you can like partition your hard drive and try and run yeah on uh parallels you can run some windows programs and it just oh it was a disaster and i probably wasted 18 months or so messing around just get good gear get a good machine get wired mouse wired keyboard power backups if you need stuff like that but invest in good stuff and what that does is give you something give you buy-in right you're like okay i've spent all this money i'm now holding myself accountable to go all in and learn this stuff and get it right and most importantly network and reach out to folks like yourself or myself or um you know anyone that you see is providing good info um just really get that give yourself that buy-in and make you hold yourself accountable for doing those things and that's what i would honestly actually do with some of the money right now because um maybe you don't want to pile in at all time highs but it's good to get started anywhere so that's kind of my long-winded answer to to the 10k question a process and gear yeah i mean i always say it's my tagline even here on youtube that knowledge pays the best dividends so i can appreciate that answer and over this, over the long term, you will seriously be thanking yourself. I hope you did get the the new updated equipment, uh, Rob. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> I did. Yeah, right. I did. Just got to double check. Right? Rob's yeah. like, no, I'm still using the same equipment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Investors, help me thank Rob for joining us here on Masters of the Market. As always, the Peerless ETF link will be down there in my pin comment and description. Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm highly Thanks recommending so much, any and all investors who are out there who wants to reach out to Rob or Eric. Both of them are on now, Masters of the Market, to reach out to Peerless. Have a chat with them. Get yourself updated and insighted with the Peerless ETF if you're really looking for income. So with that, investors, we will see you in the next one.